Okay, folks, uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And as you see, I've um, got my mask on, and I just wanted to say to uh, those of you who are watching tonight, we're receiving some very positive news from Dr. Henry and Minister Dix about the rollout of the vaccination. But it doesn't mean that we don't continue to wear a mask and take all of the safety precautions that were currently in place. Nothing's changed until we're all vaccinated, but there is some very positive signs at the light at the end of the tunnel. So um, I just appeal to our community as we have all along. We've done an exceptional job in our catchment area in containing the virus. And I think if we continue to follow the rules and recommendations of the Minister of Health and um, Dr. Henry, I think we'll be safe throughout this uh, this uh, time period until we get our vaccination, which is still rolling out right away. And uh, the other thing too that's worth keeping in mind, and it was all over the news today, was um, please don't bog down the phone lines if you're not in the group that's supposed to be <laughs> getting vaccinated. <coughs> Make sure that you uh, go on the website for Interior Health. You'll find out your more or less roughly your time for um, to be called for your vaccination. If you have a senior member of your family that's in the first group, by all means, get on the phone, help them get registered, but please don't tie up the phone lines if it's not your turn. So with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order, and I'd like to start off with the Aboriginal acknowledgement. <coughs> we would like to acknowledge the land of which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Silix and the Sinex peoples, and is home to Métis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honor their connection to the land, rivers, and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. And with that, I'd like to know if there's any late items. Hearing none, a motion to adopt the agenda as presented. Moved by Councillor Renwick, second by Councillor Woodward. All in favor? Thank you. Um, adopt the minutes of the previous meeting. There are none. Recommendations from the Committee of the Whole. There are none. And the first item on the agenda is development permit requ variance request for 1213 Stanley. <coughs> development Service has received a development variance permit application for 1213 Stanley Street to reduce the minimum front lot line setback required by the zoning bylaw from 4.5 meters to 2 meters for the purpose of constructing a second story addition. Council has been re requested to approve this variance. There's a full report from staff with maps, location, etc. And I know that several of our council members have gone on, already gone to look at the site. And with that, I'm gonna ask for a motion to either approve or reject the recommendation. Moved by Councillor Renwick. Are you moving approval, Councillor Renwick? Yes, move the motion as uh, uh, as presented. Okay, the re as presented, the Council passed the following resolution. The application for development variance permit to vary the requirements of zoning bylaw 3199-2013 for the purpose of building the second story addition be approved for lot one EPP 91721 District Lot 150, Land District 26, for 1213 Stanley Street, as per attached plans as follows. Zoning bylaw number 3199, 2013, section 417, Schedule A, to vary the minimum front lot line from 4.5 meters to 2 meters. And we need a second. Second by Councillor Lochtenberg. Questions or comments to staff from anybody? Hear, hearing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. The next uh, item on the agenda is the development variance permit application for 2417 Perrier Lane to vary the zoning bylaw to reduce the front setback. Development Services has received a development variance permit application from 2417 Perrier Lane to reduce the minimum front lot line setback required by the zoning bylaw from 4.5 meters to 2.9 meters 
for the purpose of constructing a covered front entrance. Council is being requested to approve the variance. In the uh, full list of information, there is a recommendation. Councilor Renwick? Move the recommendation. And do we have a seconder? Councilor Page, thank you. And the recommendation is that the application for development variance permit to vary the requirements of zoning bylaw 3199 2013 for the purpose of building a covered front entrance be approved for lot three, district lot 304, Kootenai District Plan, NEP 85506 2417 Perrier Lane, as per attached plans as follows. Zoning bylaw number 3199 2013, section 417 of Schedule A to vary the minimum front lot line from 4.5 to 2.9 meters be approved. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. The next uh, item on the agenda is a variance permit application for 686 Bridge Bay Road to vary the zoning uh, bylaw to reduce the front and exterior side setback. Development Service has received a development variance permit Application 686, Bridge Bay Road to reduce the minimum front lot line and the exterior side setback required by the zoning bylaw from 4.5 meters to 3 meters and 1.5 meters to 0 meters respectively for the purpose of constructing a single family home. And again, there's a full uh, report for council and there is a recommendation from staff. Councillor Page, are you moving the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Page, second by Councillor Woodward. And the recommendation is that the application for the development variance permit to vary the requirements of zoning bylaw 3199 2013 for the purpose of building a single family home be approved for strata lot nine, district lot 372, district strata plan NES230 together with an interest in common in the common property in the proportion of the unit entitlement of the strata lot as shown on form 686 Bridge Bay Road as per the attached plan as follows. Zoning bylaw number 3199-2013, section 417 of Schedule A, to reduce the minimum front lot line from 4.5 meters to 3 meters as per attached plans, to reduce the minimum exterior side yard setback from 1.5 meters to 0 meters as per attached plans. That's the recommendation. It's been moved and seconded, and I'm going to ask are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. The nine bylaws. <coughs> and we have a number of these tonight. Uh, zoning amendment bylaw for the downtown cannabis retail, bylaw number 3521 2021. Buddy's Place, a cannabis retail store at 356 Baker Street, applied to amend the zoning bylaw in order to increase the current cap of two cannabis retail stores in the downtown to three. On January 12, 2021, council directed staff to prepare amend, a amending bylaw to, the, to this effect. Council is now being asked to pass the recommendation. And we have one, two, and three here. Sarah, how would you like us to deal with these? Two. One at a time. Okay, so we have to take these one at a time, council. And uh, there are Staff, there is a staff recommendation in front of us, and we start with number one. Moved by Councillor Renwick, second by Councillor Woodward, that the zoning amendment downtown area canvas retail update bylaw number 3521 2021 be read a third time by title only. All in favor or opposed? Favor, carried. And number two, I need a mover, please. Councillor Renwick again, and Councillor Lockenberg that the zoning amendment bylaw number 3521-2021 be finally adopted. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Thank you. 
And number three, that staff be directed to inform the Liquor and Cannabis Regulatory Branch on behalf of Council in the City of Nelson that Council has amended its zoning bylaw to permanently allow for a third cannabis retail store in the downtown core and that such notice include the following information. The zoning bylaw will allow for Buddy's Place Cannabis Retail Store previously approved under the temporary use permit to operate indefinitely at 356 known as 358 Baker Street. Now that would confuse you, wouldn't it? Council recommend continued uh, continue approval of this application beyond the original three-year temporary use permit for the reason that it remains an ineligible applicant in accordance with the city's procedures bylaw. And C, following public engagement consistent with the city's bylaws and offering the public the opportunity to comment. There is no anticipated negative impact to the community. And further, the council delegate the authority to staff to provide the divide the branch with the further detailed comments as required permitting to the relocation of this rationale, sorry, pertaining to the rationale of the recommendation. And that's the final one. Hopefully you all understood that. I imagine you're reading along or maybe well ahead of me for that matter. Moved by Councillor Renwick, second by Councillor Page. Are there any questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried, thanks very much. All right, the next one up is uh, a little bit um, more detailed for council, but nonetheless, something we've been talking about. And that's the mobile vending policy. On February 9th at the regular meeting, staff presented a mobile vending. Let me open this up. Sorry, did I miss one? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, I missed one. I beg your pardon. I'm, we're on B, the zoning amendment for Laneway Housing. Sorry about that. Uh, zoning amendment for Laneway Housing, industrial scale, com in scale com computing. Okay, on December the 7th, Council referred to the zoning amendment bylaw back to staff for more information resulting from the meeting. A Council workshop on the cov lot coverage and residential density anticipating, anticipated for later in the winter. In the interim, staff have, re are, have represented, are representing the same amended bylaw, but without any lot coverage and density changes. And um, there is a staff recommendation here, but if you wish, we do have, I think, Alex with us. And, right. So uh, we had the public hearing, and if you have a question for Alex, uh, you're welcome to ask him. Councillor Page. Uh, I'm just moving it, but I, I would just okay. add a comment when I've got a seconder. Okay, so Councillor okay. Page is moving the staff recommendation that the zoning amendment to Laneway Housing Industrial Scale Computing and minor amendments, bylaw number 3512 2021, be read a third time by title only. And we need a seconder for that, and then we can give a question. Second by Councillor Woodward. And this is this to the public is a little bit confusing to be true. for me it is when you look at laneway housing and industrial computing are all sort of lumped together but they're actually they're tied but they're somewhat they're separate for that matter so in the overall picture here it's all explained so councillor page do you want to speak i'm just going to build on that as a comment to some of the stuff that's been just chatted about how we're how we're positioned as a as a tech ready community and why these two, as you alluded to, Mayor, are connected is that we are uh, putting some containment around what is an appropriate use of electrical consumption within the residential within the res residential bucket. Um, this bylaw, these bylaw changes and zoning amendment changes uh, restrict restrict industrial bid mining, Bitcoin mining and the et cetera from happening in a home if it consumes the equivalent of nine or 10 homes, I think is the number in the report, which is really where we're, we're seeing that bucket make a lot of sense that if you're burning a neighborhood worth of power to, to make a couple of Bitcoins, then that's not an appropriate use of residential property. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. It's not a ban on Bitcoin, but it certainly is a, a time and a place for some of that stuff and not in your basement. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Page. 
All right, so you moved the first, first one was moved and seconded, and that is that the zoning amendment by laneway housing industrial scale, com scale computing and uh, minor amendments bylaw number 3512 2021 be read a third time by title only. All in favor? Councillor Morrison, are you okay there? Yeah, thank you. Carried, thank you very much. And number two, that the zoning amendment, laneway housing industrial scale computing and minor amendments bylaw number 3512 2021 be finally adopted. Need a mover by Councillor Renwick, second by Councillor Page. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor? Thank you. All right, now we can go on to um, the fees and charges. <laughs> Thank you. And this again, as I started out on the last one, is a little bit more long-winded as far as what's happening here. Uh, on February 9th at the regular council meeting, staff presented a new mobile vending policy, which council adopted alongside the policy. Staff have presenting an amendment to the fees and charges bylaw with regard to encroachment agreement fees. Council is now requesting to adopt the fees and charges amended mobile vending bylaw number 3517-2021. And there's an extensive report. Thanks very much for development services and the rest of our staff to put this together, including you, Sarah. Um, and in this package, folks, there is a uh, recommendation. And to get it on the floor, I need a mover, which I have, Councillor Renwick. Need a seconder, Councillor Woodward. Now, open for discussion. Councillor Woodward. Thank you, I just, it's more of a comment. I just wanna say that the agenda package and the research that went into this, uh, just for the public's knowledge, was quite extensive with a lot of, um, a lot of communication with um, the chamber, um, mobile vendors, uh, general public, the business community. So there was a lot of um, weighing um, the positive and negatives of all this and trying to figure out just the right kind of balance um, that we can have mobile vending in um, Nelson um, without it uh, negatively affecting um, brick and mortar. So I just wanted to comment on the excellent work development services did to develop this uh, quite complex uh, program. So, thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Woodward. Further comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried. Good. Onward and upward. Okay, next up is the report on the step code and next steps. Uh, building am Amendment uh, Step Code Bylaw Number 3508-2021 was first introduced to Council on September the 8th, 2020 at the regular meeting. The Building Amendment requires a higher Step Code Standard, Step 3, in new development of residential buildings. Um, it's a Step Code Standard 2 for the new development of a complex building. Council has now requested to adopt building Amendment bylaw number 3508 2021. And once again, thank you to our development services for their good work on this file over the last uh, while. Um, we didn't get the chance we needed to consult with everybody uh, on this because of COVID, but I think they did a good job of getting a fair idea of what the community is thinking, and in particular, our building and construction community in general. So. There is a staff recommendation council, and if somebody wishes to move it, I'd be happy to uh, move by Councillor Woodward and second by Councillor Morrison that the uh, council pass the following resolution that the Corporation of the City of Nelson Building Amendment Bylaw Number 3508-2021 be finally adopted. Are there any questions or are there any comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Carried, thanks very much. The Mr. Mayor? Step, oh, sorry, somebody wanted to speak? I would, yeah, I would be opposed to that. And uh, could I have that recorded uh, for the record, please? Sorry, Councillor Remick, I didn't see your, your hand up. I'm sorry, but that's good. We, we got that, Sarah's got it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Next up is the uh, utility, electrical utility rates bylaw. Uh, on November the 12th, 2020 and November the 27th, 2020, Nelson Hydro presented to council with regards to the 2021 budget and the corresponding need for a modest annual general rate increase. Council provided staff with direction to move forward with the implementation of a 2.3% annual general rate increase for urban service area and applying to the Utilities Commission BCUC for an in, a identical rate increase for rural. And in, the, in our package, uh, folks, uh, I thought it was worth uh, reading this little piece too, if you bear with me. Uh, the rate increase is largely attributed to 4.3%, 36% general rate increase sought by Nelson Hydro Power Supplier Fortis. So we're getting an increase of 4.36% from Fortis where we buy a portion of our power, which seeks an effective date as of January 2021. The remaining a remainder of the requests an increase to a modest inflation increase in Nelson Hydro's operating budget. The rate increase will allow Nelson Hydro to recover its operational costs and earn a fair return on its asset from urban ratepayers. And at the bottom of this page, folks, and once again, thank you staff for your good work on preparing this document. The recommendation is below and I need somebody to pass the following recommendation or not. So the mover, Councillor Luckenberg, seconded by and there's Councillor Woodward. Any questions or comments? And the recommendation that's been moved and second is that Council pass the following resolution that the corporation of the City of Nelson Hydro Services Bylaw Urban Rate Amendment number 3519-2021 be finally adopted. All in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Carried. Uh, next up is the parking strategy, or the lack thereof of parking. <laughs> Call it whatever you want. But once again, we have a fully comprehensive uh, plan presented to Council. The City of Nelson has been preparing a downtown parking strategy since 2016 as part of the Development Services Annual Work Plan. Council is now being requested to approve the downtown parking strategy. Now in this um, plan, in this documentation here, um, Council, and for those of you who are watching, um, additional consultation was planned for March 2020. However, COVID-19 pandemic shifted our priorities Furthermore, 2020 did not seem to be an appropriate year to discuss new parking pricing. In light of this, staff are recommending that council proceed with approved uh, downtown parking strategy with the understanding that the additional, more specific consultation will be required prior to moving forward with many of the strategies proposed and actions. Uh, the advantage of approving the strategy at this time is to solidify council's interest in pursuing this project and a strategy proposed guiding principles uh, and the general direction for staff. So we are gonna do that additional consultation, but this allows us to continue with the program around our downtown strategy. And in there, there's a staff recommendation if somebody wishes to move it, I'd be happy to read it out. Moved by Councillor Lochtenberg, second by Councillor Renwick. Uh, and is that uh -huh. I, I, we have a mover in the sector, so I'll just read it out, and then if there's a comment, so I'll ask for comments. Uh, that council approved the City of Nelson downtown parking strategy as attached, and further, the council directs staff to begin implementation of the downtown parking strategy in 2021. And that's the mover and seconder's request, and any questions or comments? Councilor Renwick as the, uh, one of the movers and seconders, and then Councilor Lochtenberg, and then Councilor Cage. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, that was a great report, very detailed, very lengthy. Um, it's uh, certainly there's a lot of questions and concerns, I think, uh, amongst the various groups and areas of particularly the downtown and um, the, lo the, the residential uh, areas from Victoria Street up a couple of blocks. Um, but having looked at it all, 
and seeing you know some things that work here and some things that's, that work in other communities, it's very clear to me that uh, parking doesn't work perfectly anywhere. And we do have to live with what we've got. Oh, and there's Alex there. Good work, Alex. That was a, a great report. I, I've been waiting for this as we spoke over a year ago, I think. Um, you, you did very well and uh, um, good for you. Thanks, Councillor Randwick. Councillor Lockerberg and then Councillor Page. Thanks, to Alex, for this uh, this report. Um, again, good work. Sorry to lose you, um, but uh, but this is a good uh, swan song for you, if anything. Um, I have a question on the uh, a couple of things actually. One is related to the 2019 um, public consultation, and and. Actually, no, it wasn't that it was more data and I'm not quite sure it was not clear how you got this data. That's showing that free parking near the downtown is oversubscribed, but paid parking options in the downtown. Are underutilized that really jumped out at me it, but, uh, but it wasn't totally clear. Does that mean that that includes meters that includes the, the, um, the parking garage? What, what's. What does that encompass? And then what do you think it suggests uh, in terms of uh, the public's willingness to pay for parking? And is that something, uh, I have some thoughts on, on what that might mean, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, if, uh, if you can elaborate on those two things. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor. Um, yeah, it sounds like the data that you're pointing to then uh, would be the data from the occupancy studies that Development Services conducted uh, in 2016. It's quite a, a big endeavor for a small department, so it's not something that uh, we're able to update annually like some other cities. But, uh, but already then in 2016, uh, the numbers that we got, of course, Baker St Street, you know, particularly between you know uh, 11 or 12 noon and going until later in the afternoon, quite busy, uh, and that's all paid parking. But uh, when you look at the uh, the occupancy rates for those, uh, you know, two hour spaces and free uh, spaces uh, around the downtown core, uh, those are heavily subscribed again already in 2016. Whereas the uh, all day commuter options that we have that are paid, uh, you know, although the, the Cedar Street uh, all day meters didn't exist yet at that time, we still see that they're heavily undersubscribed. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing for, goes for the, the parkade, although the, the parkade is in a bit of a transition, as you know, too, moving towards more, more day rate uh, options. But, um, uh, you know, and although all the permits uh, have been generally been, you know, been sold uh, and there's been a wait list, uh, when you go into the parkade and, and those levels that have the day uh, or have the monthly pass permits, uh, there's uh, often, you know, a third to a quarter of the spaces that are, that are simply empty at any time. So there's... Um, there's uh, there's quite a gap there that we've noticed over the years, and uh, what it certainly it certainly does speak to people's you know willingness uh, to pay for parking, or at the very least, uh, people's uh, willingness to maybe go out of their way and, and take a bit of an inconvenience in order to to get the free parking. Um, that's certainly not something that's uh, that's unique to Nelson. Uh, what's perhaps unique to Nelson is a bit more of the topography and and uh, that combined, say, with the railway tracks that. Uh, that stand between people parking on Lakeside Drive and uh, and and walking into the downtown, but uh, it's certainly a phenomenon you see uh, uh, everywhere. Places where uh, paid parking is cheaper than Nelson, and places certainly where paid parking is more expensive than here in Nelson. Is is making the alternatives more convenient? So I think we're doing that with transit and the new exchange. We're we're doing that with our active transportation plan and making it more convenient to get a bike and electric bikes themselves are a more convenient option. Um, one of the things that I was sort of grappling with that seems to be a, maybe a bit of a harder problem is the rural residents who are coming into grocery shop don't preference transit at all. Um, and what's the convenience kind of component there that'll drive their behavior to um, to to and so it's, it's suggested to me, number one, that perhaps we should look at that it's not price, that we should continue to um, increase our meter pricing, and then really look at redirecting that to some micro mobility options to get people moving from inconvenient parking areas to convenient parking areas. So I just wanted to suggest that's kind of in the 
guiding principles that look a little bit more at that as we move forward. The the idea of increasing parking fees and then redirecting that to make parking in, in outer areas um, more, more convenient. That's more of a comment. It's more of a comment than an action, yeah. but it's not, it's not a bad idea. Um, you, you're right about the, the park and ride idea outside the community is the, probably the most ideal one. Uh, you know, most major cities, that's what they're doing nowadays. They're building park and rides and that seems to help somewhat. Um, one thing I did see in my travels at one point was if you had a transit ticket, you actually got a discount of businesses in the core of the community. If you could, you know, you rode transit that particular day and it was stamped for that day and time, you could actually get a discount, which helped the business because, you know, more people were. It's a great uh, idea. You, you know, were, were able to park in that place that you weren't parking in. So it didn't, it didn't affect them one way or the other, you know. So anyway. Um, that's, a, that's a great idea. Anybody else up? And, and another sort of comment, if I may, too, uh, uh, Mayor, uh, just on uh, Councilor Luxembourg's comments there as well in your, in your own is that uh, I certainly see you know, within the scope of, of what could be realistic for Nelson uh, you know, in, the, in the medium term would be uh, focusing that kind of park and ride efforts on commuters. Uh, it's, it certainly would be a, a, an ambitious long-term project to have the kind of level of uh, micro-mobility or transit service that would provide that, you know, every sort of five minute uh, bus that would, that would make, uh, make it attractive for someone who lives out of town who's coming in to, for a doctor's appointment or coming in to get groceries or something for them to park outside of town, get on a bus, you know, wait for that bus, get on the bus and come downtown. Uh, but the, the park and ride model, if, that, if the target audience is uh, people who are coming from out of town to spend half the day or the full day to work, um, I think that's where the real opportunity lies because uh, for them then, you know, maybe waiting uh, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes for the bus is more realistic on, for, you know, there's one, there's one waiting time for the whole day because they're going to be spending the whole day there. And then that way we'd be freeing up parking in, uh, in the downtown and area for people who are just coming in for those short-term visits. Yeah, because our population can double in sometimes during the year, really, people coming in. Okay, next up, anybody else have a comment? I just, um, Councillor Woodward. Uh, I think one of the projects. Councillor Page. Kevin, one I'm sorry. Uh, one of the projects we have in the in the books is creating this additional way to get across the track. So um, we're not actually very far from Lakeside Drive. We're actually really, really close to it. It's, you have to get across those tracks. So, you know, this Ward Street pedestrian over overpass, you know, if we can get one of those that just opens up that whole area for convenient um, access into the downtown here, literally two or three blocks from, from Warden Baker. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I think Councillor Woodward, you had a hand up on Councillor Page. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just, it's, it's a bit of a, it's a comment really. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Alex. It's an excellent piece of work you've done. Um, what I was really appreciative of were the focus areas. Uh, there was uh, 13 focus areas and this whole idea of um, kind of trying to um, get people to sort of um, Think about parking in a different way where you're not just leaving your home, coming into town, doing what you do and going back, but more of a, um, a fluid uh, process. Uh, so, you know, having uh, like the park and ride ideas, uh, the car sharing ideas, um, and then, but also in that process, protecting the people who are living close to downtown so they're not overwhelmed with uh, people, you know, grabbing a parking space. I just also wanted to mention too that in your report, um, you know, only it says here six percent of parking in Nelson is paid parking. So you know that's a very small amount of that's actually paid. Um, so I just you know it's um, kind of incredible what we do with on that little bit of uh, revenue, but uh, that a lot of parking in Nelson as it stands is you know you have a couple of hours or so that you have to to work with so. Yeah, but I just wanted to uh, thank you for you know having that vision to look forward to a time when parking will be shifting and changing as our habits of how we move around, uh, how we share uh, vehicles, uh, and then of course the electric 
transition, which will be coming over the next, hopefully, 10 years. Um, that's going to play a big, big part of how cars uh, come and go electrically. So thank you very much for your work, Alex, and we will really miss you. So thank you. So on that note, Alex, I noticed that in your report about the electric car coming, you know, which clearly is happening, um, but it's still a car. It takes up a space. It doesn't matter how it's propelled. It's still taking up a space. So it'd be a, it'd be foolish for us to think if we had electric cars tomorrow morning that would solve our parking issue. It one hundred percent. It certainly will not solve it, right? any parking issue. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's <laughs> if anything, okay. it, it does make it a bit more challenging when you consider the the charging aspects. Of course. And of course, electric. You know, particularly every, you know every year the range of electric cars gets higher and higher. Right. So you're yeah. into the four hundred kilometers now and. People don't need to charge their electric car every time they park, so that 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 that's the saving grace here, right? But uh, but uh, it does, if anything, add that little bit of complexity uh, to have you know just a minimal number of chargers uh, around town. Thank you. There, there will be that um, self-driving option, though, where you can, yeah. your car drives away yeah. and you. It's, but I'd rather. It's the but I'd, but I'd rather I'd rather a person come into town on the bus than send the car in. Yeah. Now it'll be. Uh, <laughs> You know, the autonomous vehicles that will will solve parking. They do not need to park. Why would they? They'll just make our traffic worse. <laughs> no, you only need a few to drive us all around. All right, Councillor Page. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that is, those are all you know the aspirational changes we hope to see come. Where we don't all own a vehicle, but we all have cars that drive to us and pick us up and take us places and go back to their parking stalls. And, and maybe maybe that is the system we'll end up with. And I think um, my first challenge here with this is because this is a comprehensive system that touches so many pieces, we've had letters recently about the transit, transit exchange. We've had letters recently about the, the access to parking for some of the developments downtown uh, and your your detailed work touches on all of this. And so one of the things I see missing here is the presentation at the committee of the whole that then serves as a backstop and a record in, in, the, in the video stuff on YouTube, things that can be passed around to the community as these issues are brought up. Are we going to have an opportunity before we lose Alex to, to have uh, a full updated presentation of all of this work? Uh, so there is something to say, you know what we have considered all of the detailed nuances for parking, and here, here's here's a reference from a video we did back in back in March of 2021, because I think there's so many of the kinds of things I see come across in terms of concerns and comments from the public that touch on parking in some way or are affected by some of the implementation strategies around parking, be it, be it striving for an 85 percent utilization rate and and bumping bumping around the uh, the cost recovery to achieve that be it the guest parking residential passes that may or may not be available because uh, I know this isn't an implementation implementation piece but I go back to the presentation we got from Gabe about hydro and that is so useful to say here's a really good staff explanation of a really big lift that staff has done to then be able to make that content very much accessible to the general public and say, you know what, we covered this in great detail and here's the approach. And then you can reference and say, well, there's the plan on the website and here's where our implementation state is. So will we have an opportunity to have one of those created or not? Well, I would say um, uh, we could do one of two things. We could do it at a cow if you think um, you, you will get people to watch that or you want people to know that it was done at a cow. Um, but Alex has also been our uh, video star on some other projects we've done. So we could, you know, literally just do, you know, he could do the presentation that would be recorded and available. Yeah, so on that note, Kevin, um, I mean, I understand what Councillor Page is saying. Um, and it's unfortunate we work in this environment on a regular basis where we do a lot of good work and and that we, we put it out to the best of our ability and not everybody picks up on it. This particular document is quite extensive and has a lot of data in it and web and uh, links to much more data. Um, but get, getting it up on our website and letting people know that it's available to them, I think will be quite helpful. 
Um, going forward, of course, COVID has changed almost everything that we do. Uh, in normal conditions, we probably would have an open house on something like this when it's finalized and show it off to the public at either the library or summer city hall or maybe the museum art gallery. Um, that's still so possible that's still going possible. forward because um, a, lo a lot of what's in here is in place today, but there's some ideas in here that will be ongoing over a number of years as we, as we move forward. Um, but I, I get what you're saying, Councillor Page, it's getting more and more difficult to engage people yeah. than it has been in the past, and maybe, we, maybe there's a greater onus on us to do a better job, but, um, you know, bringing a I would just, just say it's an opportunity. Start, so. Yeah, and, um, you know, I know Ginger's uh, really big on, you know, using uh, video as opposed to, um, you know, putting things on the, you know, they still reside on our web page and things like that. That written stuff is, uh, she's seen really good success when we do these short little video clips and, you know, you, you bring it down to the, you know, the key things that this represents and the person that um, is interested in the detail, you know, can click through to that detail. And as Alex said, this is, you know, a start. This is, you know, the, you know, the basis of um, some actions that can be taken and those will uh, be ongoing and, and but this would be a good introduction of, of what this is all about and what you can uh, you know uh, uh, look forward to seeing in the in the future and and as Councillor Page said you know the comprehensive uh, kind of um, you know approach to this and we were um, you know fortunate that you know that was Alex's master was was in in this area so so we had some of the you know some really good skill set to know to bring it to the quality of, of what this is so on your trip across so, canada alex you'll have no trouble finding parking then right well i'll go uh, in the that's back your, alleys and I'll, I'll find the free stuff everywhere <laughs> <laughs> okay any further questions about well, alex you might as well persecute him while he's still here i mean he's leaving in a couple of weeks so now's your chance no further questions of alex okay thanks very much alex uh okay all in favor Thanks very much, carried. Okay, next up is reports. And there's accounts payable, building permit stats and purchasing financial report. Man, I'll tell you these building permit applications, if this is the early part of the year and it's, it's a busy little town, that development service must be hopping over there. And Alex, you're leaving at the wrong time. Oh, he's gone, he already left, okay. <laughs> Um, if so, if there's anything in any of those reports you want to pull out, you're more than welcome to uh, to do so, Council, if you want to speak to anything. Otherwise, I can, I'll can ask for a motion for receipt of uh, all of those reports. Moved by Councillor Woodward, second by Councillor Morrison. All no, speak? I would like to speak about my report. Well, <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, we can ahead. move the first three. Yeah, move the first three. All in favour? Carried, thank you. All right, Council Morrison, Regional District, Financial Okay, report. so just there, yeah, um, thank you. So you'll see attached there um, uh, two reports. One is the uh, copy of the public meeting that was presented on March the 3rd by the CAO of the, of the Regional District um, pertaining to the cities of Nelson, Area E and Area F. And I've just attached, I've asked that to be attached just for um, information. Um, Councillor Page uh, did attend for part of the meeting, and and also, um, given that there's three councillors that live outside the city of Nelson, you might want to see how it's how your taxes are are broken down because um, you missed the meeting. It wasn't at the most convenient time, right at dinner hour five to five to seven isn't the best time for everybody to be attending attending these meetings. Um, and today, I believe that uh, um, CFO McClure uh, sent out an email, I think it went to everybody, that summarized uh, our the budget uh, position looks like for the city of Nelson in terms of our RDCK uh, services um, going ahead to the uh, budget. So the next meeting of the uh, RDCK, which is next Thursday, um, not this one, but the next one, where we would do the final passing of the budget. So 
we are going to be looking at, uh, you know, a fairly substantive increase in, in uh, taxes uh, at the City of Nelson that will be going to the Regional District. The majority of those um, will be in regards to uh, the central waste, which we've discussed um, at length in the past. That's going up uh, uh, 20 20%. Um, the last thing that we negotiated was yesterday we did regional parks and we've actually got a reduction um, in the regional parks budget this year of 3.19% uh, uh, um, after quite a long discussion we managed to land on on, on, on a reduction um, as opposed to a bigger um, amount of going into an appropriated surplus to be spent in 2022. Um, other than that, I mean, transit is up a little bit and so Anyways, you do have those final um, documents available to you. The other document attached there is actually um, out of the, uh, the discussion at last month's board meeting regarding um, the COVID uh, re recovery uh, funds for the RD. Um, a lengthy, um, fairly lengthy report that came from community services uh, and they have decided that they will be giving recreation, our recreation that we're involved with, Rec 5, the Nelson area, E and F, and defined, defined E area, um, $91,000. Um, that hasn't been what's, how that's being, it's being allocated to recreation, whether or not that's directed to our capital projects or how it's being directed has not yet been determined, but um, I just wanted to bring that forward for information because as we continue our budget discussions, we have started um, to look at what we might do with some of our COVID recovery uh, funds and we have flagged recreation as a potential place to be um, putting some, some dollars. So I just wanted you to have the report of how the uh, regional district went about um, distributing some of their funds. They are doing a bit of a holdback until I believe the end of the third or the beginning of the fourth quarter. Um, and so we would have that document available as we continue our discussions um, going forward in terms of the um, our budget for the city of Nelson for 2022 and the allocation of our COVID recovery funds. So that's my report. If anybody's got a question, I'll try my best to answer it correctly. Councillor Morrison, the, uh, maybe this is something for Colin uh, Mature, but I'm sure you're probably up to speed on it too. What is the overall tax increase at the regional district? I know you're saying there's 20% at waste increase to us, and there's 3% to parks. And what is, what is the actual hit on the Nelson taxpayer at this point in time? Is it, um, is it within, is it within uh, the bounds that we're in, or is it far beyond, or is it... Uh, at the rate of inflation, or is it? Is and it we're looking at a six point. It's six point four three percent. I believe is the number. Two hundred seventy one thousand. Sorry. Uh, on that. Oh, Two hundred seventy one thousand dollars. Okay, more than last about. year. I'm sorry, Colin. Over was, last year. I was kind of speaking over you there. Did you say six hundred? No. Oh, Two hundred and seventy one thousand dollars is the expected increase to our taxpayers for the RDCK services okay. that we are involved in. So it's six, a 6.43% 6 increase. That's where you heard the six. Yeah. Okay. And, and again, we sometimes base that on, if you were looking at our taxpayers, that uh, about 90 to 95,000 is a 1% uh, a tax increase on our, our community as that's what we look at it. So you would say that you'd be looking at close to 3% this year for RECK. Now, again, as the councillor Morrison mentioned, a big chunk of that is for waste. Uh, mostly the things she was able to work with cost containment and uh, with her other parties to um, keep the keep, uh, either lower or um, uh, keep them pretty steady on the other increases. Uh, the question that I have, of course, will be, and as we always wait, is we don't know what school tax looks like. Uh, last year, businesses got a break. We still don't know what the hospital tax will be. Um, so we're starting to, you know, right now you're looking at that kind of an increase. So we've, you know, council's talked about an inflationary type increase for, uh, you know, in that one to two percent range for, um, for the city uh, taxpayer. And so, you know, yeah, the numbers, the numbers start to go up. And one of the, and one of the things that um, just so everybody's aware is that 
um, GIS has, has gone up, um, I don't know, about 15% again this year. And so we're now paying about eighty four, eighty five $85,000 for GIS. And the regional district is aware that, that we are um, taking a close look at um, our GIS and whether or not we're using this at the rate of $84,000. I mean, it's just like, are we getting good service for value? What are we ne needing to do? And I know that the planning department in the city is is looking at their utilization. And then, I mean, the discussion would be as to, you know, coming back probably not until next year, uh, whether or not we continue on or if we look at other alternatives for where we would do our, get our GIS um, information and work uh, done. Because next year, there is an expectation that the uh, per thousand rate, so there will be a bylaw adjustment so that they can increase the maximum um, that they can charge uh, per thousand uh, within this service. So, so something to keep in mind for next year. What a, what a uh, question, Councilor Morrison. The, they deferred some last year to keep the budget a little bit lower. They made some deferrals on spending. Is that still off the table or is that back on the table? In regards to a particular service or? Well, I don't know if it was hiring people or what the situation was, but it wasn't taken out of the budget. It was, uh, it was passed on to this year, some of the uh, savings. They well, there was some, there was, yeah, there wasn't, there wasn't like, it wasn't like we did, they didn't have an increase last year. I can't remember exactly what the actual increase was. It was, it, it was seven or, yeah. Was, they would not be seven percent. I mean, it, so they didn't do zero. Like we had asked, we had asked them to contemplate yeah. trying to get yeah. to zero, which which they weren't able to do. There was some deferment when we did go in and carve one a million. I, I think we took a million or a million and a half out of the budget when we looked at it again before its deadline date, which was quite a run because because they have to file by March and the fact that we went into COVID in like the beginning of March, it was a very short time period to try to figure out what the budget might look like. Um, that there was some deferment of the hiring of a CFO until later in in uh, in the year, in this year, and that's been deferred again until um, next year. Uh, but but most things have gone through. But what there was deferred was a lot of uh, initial um, debt repayment that was, and either Kevin or Colin can explain how this works. But there is like a when you start to get debt in these services, you can actually push it out one year. And so there was a few things that we borrowed for and that we didn't have to start the debt payment in this year in 20, um, in 2020, we didn't have to start it, but we do have to start it this year in 2021. So what we kind of pushed is now here to be paid for. Yeah, in terms of some a, of the debt a, servicing. Yeah, it's a timing difference because if they've gone for borrowing at MFA, they have two intakes a year. One is in the fall and one is in the spring. And once they, uh, Get that debt, then there's sort of a time frame to whichever one. As long as you get the approval for the debt, when you take it on, is a question that you can you can have yeah, a bit of a sway. Move it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I can hold it short term until. Right. Yeah. You know, until they choose to lock into long term, right? Right. Yeah. When, uh, so how yeah. how do we get um, like when I look at other municipalities around the province, most people are staying around the rate of inflation. How do we have that conversation about doing the same thing as an example at the regional district? So is there a way of, <laughs> I mean, it's all, lo it's all local government, you know, we're all in this, this boat together. So, because we, like we look at our taxation on our budget, um, trying to keep it within reason what we feel our community can palate. Um, and then we have other levels of government, like the school district, as an example. But in this case, we have a seat at the table, the regional district, and that number doesn't seem to coincide with what we try to do here. So for us to absorb additional costs from some other level, we have to try and keep our number down to be able to fit that in, in the overall picture. Right? So I'm just wondering, is there any appetite for additional savings, do you think? Um, I think that I've probably pushed this wagon as far uphill by myself um, as I can at this time. 
Um, there have been, I would say, a few more concerned citizens within the regional district who are um, starting to ask um, more questions of their representatives um, in terms of the ongoing increases in taxation, which they're really starting to feel because their assessments have also um, gone gone up. And so, I mean, it's it's out there. I mean, I don't know how much harder a person can push. I mean, our, our biggest concern, obviously, is the city of Nelson is, um, you know, S1 service 187, which is central waste, which had a, um, you know, 24% increase last year and has a 20% increase this year. And it's probably going to have a 15% increase next year. And so that's one of the um, biggest drivers, all, all going back to the same story that isn't new to the table. And that's about the um, closure of the HB um, tailings pond. So, um, you know, I work very hard to try to get uh, uh, regional parks to be a negative number, which we finally landed on yesterday and working to get general administration of which we pay you know, a, a, a fair portion of considering we have our own administration here in the city of Nelson to be flat at zero. So, um, and then we do have recreation um, under the leadership of uh, Councillor Page has uh, managed to hold at about a 1.85 increase. So something that looks that, that looks like inflation, so. Yeah. Okay, I think we had two questions here. I think we had Councillor Lochtenberg and Councillor Page. Janice, a couple, sorry, there's an echo there. A couple of questions for you. Uh, number one is the, our contribution to general admin. Is it, um, and, cor and correct me if I'm ignorant on this one, what's the, uh, the, the, the ratio of area E contribution to general admin per 100,000 versus the city of Nelson? Do we pay the same? Is it the same contribution? It's always the same contribution. So all services, um, so, so it is once you get this, like it, it takes a long time for me to get convinced that this is actually how it works, but um, everybody pays the same per thousand. So um, if I was open my, let me see here. I mean, probably Colin's got a budget book there that he can open a lot faster than I do, but. Um, it's, in, it's in that report that's in the package there. Yeah, and it's, prob it's probably in the report. We all pay the same per thousand. So then again, it's based on on how much how much is your house worth, right? Right, and it's yeah. something that it, it, I guess that this is something a question I've asked a few times in different ways, but it pointedly, is that something that we have any control over? Is it the go? It's it's set. We're locked in. Just forget about it, or is there something we can? Because like I said, we don't use it to the same degree that say area E or F yeah. do at all. What, and what, what are you talking about specifically there? Is there, is there is general admin one of those services that we could say order a service review or do anything? It's just, or is it, yeah. it's what we could. Yeah, we yes. have our own, we have our own administration. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the, the question. What is there any points of leverage in terms of working with, uh, with general admin? It seems to be the one that bothers me. I, I'm not as bothered by GIS. I did have a question, but we can save it for another day about GIS, but the general admin is the one that seems to there seems to be an inequity there that needs to be resolved if it's even possible well i think the other thing you need to remember about general min what they're taxing in general min is what's left over because they've already allocated i don't know how much janet janice at least 50 percent of those costs out to other services yeah, yeah. plan general min and recreation and and waste and all those other things that we're actually paying a higher percentage of those services so um, they tend to look at it what's the net taxation you know when i look at it i go what's the total cost that cost keeps rising and they're just allocating more to other services they're still general and then to me it's still you know getting out of hand right so sure, you know, that's yeah. the budget you need to be managing is the total cost so yes you can ask for a service review um you know they do um like i said allocate costs out to services so i think they've done a better job of that in recent years but um you know there is something called rule administration as well and you know our position would be like most of the time that that probably should pick up more of the cost because that is where 
most of that staff time is is spent is actually on the rural part of the of the um, RD, not on the city. Yeah, side. and this year, and this year, um, I think I think um, I'd have to look, but I think rural administration was flat last year, but rural administration this year is going up five percent, where we're holding general administration at zero. So, um, and and there is there is some there is wiggle room in there, and it's not for um, a lack of trying to be creative mm -hmm. about ways around that because it does contain um, directors um, stipends and travels and and uh, uh, increases and I, I did at one point try to um, bring a motion forward that that directors and perhaps ex ex excluded staff didn't receive uh, their um, cost of living increase this year because uh, everybody took it in in um, 2020 and uh, that that didn't fly um, again this round when I when I tried that it, it doesn't make for a lot of money but I thought in terms of just the intent and, yeah. and trying to just show that that you know that you yeah. realize that your constituents aren't maybe as fortunate as you are in having a regular um, paycheck we didn't take our our increases last year and we held back um, the executive team's um, increases last year and I thought maybe you know that discussion could be had again and it we had it and it didn't pass so just for clarification again that those those stipends come out of general admin mm -hmm. and so have we ever had a service review on general admin would that be something we would consider Castigar did one about 10 years ago mm -hmm. okay yeah and some of that some of the director's expenses do come out of out of rural admin as well it doesn't it's not 100 percent out of general administration but there is line items in general administration that covers some directors' costs and travel and conferences. The one that uh, yeah, the one that uh, jumps out of me, uh, apart from that, General Admin, is uh, yeah. it'd be interesting to know what the total cost of, as is known in here as refuge disposal in the central subregion, what's the total regional cost? I mean, it just seems to me like we keep continuously finding new ways to divert product, reduce waste supposedly, and yet and all that service so, just skyrockets yes. through the roof on a regular basis like what it makes no sense it's not adding up you know like the whole idea was if you're reducing waste yeah. it should cost less somehow but when you see those kind of 20 percent increases in one year in a service yes. that's supposed to be diverting product yeah. and and making a difference to the environment it just seems to me it should be getting smaller rather than bigger Well, one of the things about central waste in particular is the fact that as much as we would like to see um, resource recovery be um, user pay, um, we're still very heavy compared to uh, West Waste and East Waste in terms of uh, um, taxpayer pay. We're, our, we're, we're like 50-50 and some of the other ones are like 70-30. Like it's, we are highly, um, subsidized here by the by the taxpayers um and in part i think i think i read a report about something like 16 percent of this budget goes to um the hb mine issue tailings bond issue so you know ho hopefully at some point in, in in somebody's lifetime that gets finalized and that debt gets paid that we're borrowing the five million to work on closing it, and maybe the central waste will have a negative year one year in terms of increases. Yeah, it, it really, I really, I, I agree with you, Janice, about the the allocation of costs. But at the end, of, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, regardless of who's paying, the cost of it is still going up. And um, yeah. you know, the the whole premise going back to the days of declaring zero waste as a goal. Um, was that we would be paying less uh, because we'd be diverting more product, we'd be getting more money in return for that product. Like that's what we were sold. That's the that's the image that we sold to the community. Like in your house and mine right now, when I look at the amount of waste that we divert uh, from the landfill today compared to what it was, say, even say five it. five years ago, ten years ago, is astronomical, and yet and all that cost keeps going up. So. Waste diversion is not really working. It's um, it's, uh, there needs to be a new vision for 
how we manage waste somehow to get control of that, uh, continue to have that separation of product and recycle the product, but how do we get control of the cost? That's, that's the big thing, you know? I mean, no, and by, should... by charging people more doesn't solve the problem. All it does is pay the same bill. Nobody's coming back saying nope. the bill's smaller. You know, the, the easy last year reduced. Pardon? Well, last year reduced because it's costing you more. That's why you have user fees is, you know, the theory is I make different decisions by on how much waste I produce if I'm not actually paying for it. And that's, um, so Janice, on that, where um, where are we with recycling? That was one of the, you know, the key things that, that lot, you know, the, the last council brought up was that we already have a recycling program in, in Nelson and we should not be funding a rural one across the region, especially where we established a number of depots that were not been funded by recycled DC no. were uh, extremely expensive. And I think that's played out, but did I hear that it's cost a million dollars a year or something on recycling now or? Yes, it will by, 20, just... in the, by the end of the next 20, by the end of the five year plan, it'll be about a million dollars. So um, yeah. in terms of that, um, they're well aware of that uh, conversation that whenever, whenever we talk about recycling, I do bring that up. I brought that up at the last meeting. There is more at joint. There's more people that I think that perhaps they've heard my irritating voice enough times that I think that there's more people that are sort of interested in seeing um, the direction that we're going in there and that we have to take a look at that. And with the way that they are slowly starting to reconfigure how we look at the budget, you can actually see um, what what the costs are and what the expenses are. They've done a bit of budget reconfiguring. Um, I've asked again that they continue to um, show the breakout operating and capital and have it more um, within each of like the actual garbage part, the recycling part, and then making sure that it's organics. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I have heard again at the table that they are looking at, and we had a motion passed at the last meeting uh, led by Mayor um, Lockwood about looking at a separate service. Again, it's about the syntax of what we use for language there, but a separate way of out looking at how all of that starts and gets built and built out to trying to ensure that that is um, cost recovery uh, there for the um, organics part. So um, I'm hoping that we're going to see a few more reports. I, I did get a bit of pushback because they do want to, they've got a timeline right now in regards to trying to get the uh, resource recovery plan uh, completed so it can get off to the ministry. And actually having that done will probably make a few of the things that we want to do easier because if they're embedded in the resource recovery plan, uh, then there's uh, no excuse that we have to do a AAP or a referendum or something to try to change or look at other uh, service uh, development if it's embedded into that uh, resource recovery plan. And I believe um, uh, CAO Cormac, you're on that committee and attend those meetings, so. Yeah, we haven't met in a, a while now. It got delayed like everything else with with COVID. Um, yeah, the user uh, pay on the on the waste side. So I know now, you know, in my household, using you know the food cycler and recycling, you know, we produce maybe a small bag every two or three weeks, and the fact that I'm paying, you know, four hundred and I think I figured it out $350 a year for my one bag every three weeks where if I'm in Meadow Creek where my house is worth a quarter of that, I pay, you know, $100 and I can produce as much waste as I want. So, you know, there's clearly an equity in pricing around waste. It shouldn't be on the value of your home. It should actually be on the piece of waste you, you produce. Councillor Page, you can patiently waiting. Ah. Practice, I was practicing my patience. Um, yeah, to, picking up on that conversation about, because I think a lot of this stuff comes down to to clarity a lot of the times and whether things are in the right budget sheets. And I'm noticing within the general administration, I was wondering if you could touch on it, Director Morrison, the Parks and Trails Master Plan is happening in general administration, which seems 
like it has a more appropriate home to live as well as the Kootenai Boundary Farm Advisory Program. I know I'm just picking those off the top of the <laughs> yeah, thanks. list there, but it just seems those should be allocated into their respective services that are driving those. I And, and I wonder how they ended up in general administration. Um, I, I can't really speak to the Kootenai food one because that's a result of the rural directors and their uh, CSLAC, uh, um committee. But I think that sometimes those are um, in that uh, budget when you break it down and it's under grants because a, a number of these things are grant driven and because mm -hmm. they're pertaining to the majority. So in terms of the, the Kootenai Farmers Advisory, um, I mean, that's pretty much an uh, RD wide. I mean, it affects the city of Nelson, but I mean, CSLAC is the one that does more of it and we're not at that particular um, table. Uh, in terms of um, what was the other one you mentioned? Uh, the Parks and Trails Master Plan. Parks and Trails, plan. the Parks and Trails Master Plan. So again, that is something that you can't, uh, that's a master plan. So we're talking about the whole of the regional district. So we're trying to actually do something regional with the regional parks master plan, um, which is something that I really strongly support and advocate for. And so to stick it into somebody's budget wouldn't, it's, it's not really appropriate because we have, there's seven different recreation um, budgets. And then there's some things that people just have a one off of. And so it's under the umbrella of general administration because everybody at the table is talking about it. Okay, I had some assumptions, you checked them and now we're all good, thanks. <laughs> Although I would say on that parks, allocate it to the seven services. Like it's, it doesn't have to be in general a minute. It just makes the general administration budget unmanageable because you've got all these bits and pieces from everywhere else. You know, allocate those the seven services and serve it. In fact, I don't think it's a proper expense to meet general management. It needs to be in a service that actually does that. Parks and recreation. Okay. Thank you. It's worth something to contemplate. Yep. Any further questions? I just, oh, I just wanted to answer, um, if I could, just um, uh, Councillor Lockenberg's uh, question about general min. Just so you know that general min is costed out. So if you want to calculate what your general min is going to be, it's uh, this year it's uh, 0.84 cents uh, per thousand is what you're paying for general admin. So that's your general administration costs. So 336 bucks for a $400,000 home. Is that right? No, that's too much. So eight, eight cents, 0 0.084 per thousand. Okay. So I'm thinking it's 34, you got too many zeros on there, I think. Sure. Okay, thanks very much, Councilor Morrison. Uh, good. Onward and upward. Um, anything else on the reports? Colin, uh, purchasing. Anything on the building and planning, development services, Kevin? Uh, nothing. The rusty moose is gone, I see. Um, we passed all those. They're all gone. Minutes are all we done. We passed them all. Minutes are all done. Good. Thank you. Um, we're done. Uh, we have still have some work to do in the closed meeting, and I'd like a motion to adjourn the regular council meeting, please. Councillor Renwick, Councillor Lockenberg, all in favour? Thank you very much. Just give us a few minutes here to get shut down and re. Stay on. Re yeah, just stay on. You don't have to log out. <laughs>